growing up, race was not something that I was very interested in, whether that be the meaning of one's racial identity or e even the history of race. My attitude has always been racism is stupid. I feel bad for actual racists. Um, and uh, because they're just, you know, they, they have a pathetic and uh, limiting worldview and that the rest of us should basically get on with it um, and do whatever interesting things that you as an individual want to do and that are within your capabilities and associate with whom whoever you want to associate with fall in love with whoever you want to fall in love with marry whoever you want to marry and it's it's nobody's business hi coleman hey bob how you doing good how are you i can't complain let me introduce this i'm robert wright publisher of non-zero newsletter you're coleman hughes a very young but very accomplished writer and podcaster, and it turns out, hip hop artist. We're gonna uh, we'll talk a little about a new album you've got out. Mm -hmm. um, so you've written for the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and so on. You've uh, your podcast is called Conversations with Coleman. Your Substack is called Coleman's Corner. So we got plenty of alliteration going on in your life, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I want to do. Uh, to start out by asking, I mean, first of all, I can tell just you know by perusing your uh, your your podcast your uh, podcast that uh, you know you have broad ranging intellectual interests, but you kind of burst on the scene a few years ago in the context of a specific set of issues with a specific kind of ideological angle, and I wanted to ask mm. you: is it is it fair to call? your ideology anti-woke or is that too simple that's not the sum total of my ideology but that's certainly a, a position that i am comfortable being labeled as yeah i'm i i do consider myself anti-woke under my definition of wokeness what's your definition means, so i would say wokeness as i see it is it's the belief that all of these institutions and ideas, which are the foundation of certainly American society, whether that be freedom of speech, uh, market economies, uh, meritocracy, the rule of law, that these are not just neutral or beneficial systems, but they're systems built to benefit straight white men and to exclude by their very nature and oppress other identities. And that if you don't agree with that, you should essentially be pursued like the religions of old would pursue heretics and blasphemers. Mm -hmm. That's the set of beliefs I would call wokeness. And, and that, that I'm definitely against. And, and the, the writing that, uh, when my writing really began to blow up as, as much as writing can blow up in the rather niche spheres that, um, sort of you, you and I and others operate in was when I was at Columbia writing for Quillette and noticing that students on campus were more pessimistic about race relations than my own grandparents who grew up under Jim Crow. And I was not a person very interested in the concept of race at that point. I was a philosophy student, I was a musician, and I was interested in kind of the kind of science writing that that you have done um that was really what i was into academically as well as music and i felt i was sucked into the issue by the fact that you know every it felt like every other day on campus i was being called into this narrative wherein i was supposed to pretend that i was a victim of everyday racism and i became curious about it because of that because of the lived experience of being a black person on what I felt to be an extremely progressive campus. And yet people were speaking as if it were Jim Crow 2.0. I, be I became curious about that dissidence and I, I wanted to explore what's going on here. Essentially, that's how I came to write about the topic of race. Okay. And how did you get to Columbia in the first place? Now you grew up in Montclair, New Jersey. Is yeah. that right? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I we actually looked when we moved uh, up north from Washington. 
a little more than 20 years ago. We actually looked at houses in Montclair. So at that point, mm. you would have been uh, maybe in elementary school or something. I don't know. Uh, but but um, mm -hmm. it's a it's a on the one hand, it's a it's a it's a largely affluent, very progressive. Pretty white uh town but there is a certain amount of socioeconomic diversity and, and the school system they kind of take pains to uh create diversity within each elementary school as i recall there's some kind of lottery system or something i mean what was what was your situation in montclair like uh it was great it was a great town to grow up in it's i, th I think the demographics are about 60 percent white 30 percent black 10 percent um other so it is uh it was an affluent town, um, but more racially diverse than the vast majority of affluent towns. Um, so it was, yeah, I, I grew up uh, very privileged socioeconomically, uh, wanting for nothing. And, um, but also I, I did not grow up being the, you know, the only black kid on the block. Mm hmm um, because, you know, Montclair, more and more I've realized how unique a town Montclair is in having both affluence and racial diversity. That's mm -hmm. not, generally it's a choice, in many cases it's a choice between those two. And there's a certain amount of socioeconomic diversity. In other words, there are a number of relatively low-income Blacks who live in a particular yeah. part of Montclair. And then they, End, they yeah. make sure to mix them up within each school, the different uh, different kind of groups. Right. Okay. And you were, um, and how would you describe your own background? I mean, your father went to Howard University, I take it. Yeah. And... Yeah. My dad is black and, um, the Hughes family, which is my dad's side, uh, descends from Thomas Jefferson's Monticello plantation mm. and they've, they've kept very good records. So we're quite, quite proud of the lineage of that lineage uh and on my mother's side she was the i believe the first in her family born in in the south bronx in the puerto rican enclave both her parents immigrated from puerto rico in the late 50s mm -hmm. um okay and so did, did you did you live in the in the more or less affluent part of montclair i lived in the more affluent part of montclair okay. yeah and i'm just curious uh how, how did you, who did you relate to socially most in school? Like now you went to, after elementary school, I guess you went to a, a private school, right? Starting in sixth grade. Starting in sixth grade. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and, and you, um, so by that time you were kind of out of Montclair in effect, I guess. And, and those are, I guess, by adolescence. Yep. Pretty much. I mean, I, I still actually hung out in Montclair quite a bit in my later adolescence as a musician, because all my musician friends that I networked with and hung out with were, were Montclair people. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you started, uh, or what, you started studying violin or something early? When I was about three. Uh -huh. Yeah, but I really got good at trombone when I was 12, 13, 14. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, the re one reason I'm getting into all this <clears throat> is, I, I guess I'll just ask you, what is your theory as to why you approached these issues so differently from a lot of black students at Columbia. Do you, do you trace it to background or what? Um, that's a good question. So I can tell you growing up in Montclair from say the time my memory started forming until you know, 11, 12 years old when I was out of the Montclair public school system, I had friends of, of every race. I mean, I would say probably if, of my five best friends, maybe three were black and two, you know, one was Jewish and one was white, um, probably non-Jewish. And I never, never thought of them as raced, as some people might mm -hmm. say. I never really thought of them as belonging to a particular race. Um, I just thought of them as their individual selves, and that seemed to be the prevailing social attitude. Um, I think many parents have this experience with their children, where their, their children don't quite recognize race as a category until a certain age. 
Um, yeah, there, there's I, something I, great about kids until the age of 12 or so. They they really are not quite literally race blind, but close to it in my experience. Mine too. Um, and so when I went from Montclair to New York Academy, I mean, it was right around that age when kids start taking race a, a little more seriously. If the adults around them, I think, cue them to, to do that or the society around them, I should say. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I definitely began to experience friction with my race right at that time because I went from a school where probably one in three kids were black to a school, a private school, more elite private school where I was one of four black kids in a, in a class of maybe 70. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, I had this one really qu quite annoying experience where I had a huge Afro at the time and the white kids from this new school, many of them came from towns that were not diverse. I, I, mm -hmm. I didn't understand this at the time, but the white kids in Montclair were totally used to seeing Afros and cornrows and every type of hairstyle because mm -hmm. a third of the kids at, at their school day to day were black. It was not strange to them. Whereas I was unusual to white kids at, at Newark Academy. So they would constantly come up and be asking to touch, touch my hair, kind of yeah. like a zoo animal. Yeah. And at first I didn't care, but it just kept going on and on and on. It, it wouldn't stop. And one day I just went home and just broke down in hot tears. Like what I, I didn't even understand. I was so annoyed that this kept going on and it was never bullying, right? It was never actually trying to belittle me. It was genuine curiosity mm -hmm. and lack of awareness that this might be an, be annoying to me right so i don't know how the whole i don't really remember how the whole thing resolved but i ended up cutting my afro it stopped happening and in general i had a great experience at that school uh -huh. so it was really a blip on what was otherwise a, a great education but you asked me why why i think i approach this issue differently i mean one reason may be because i i remember growing up in montclair in what what I believe is close to the end goal that Martin Luther King envisioned, which is really kids holding hands, not thinking about each other's race, uh, the parents having no qualms about, oh yeah, go go have a play date with such and such, not even really thinking about the fact that he's another race. I felt I grew up, I grew up pretty close to that ideal between zero and say eleven years old, mm -hmm. and I'm and the rhetoric. I, I heard at Columbia seem to uh, point in a very different direction. And do you, in think other words, sorry, sorry. In other words, I think that ideal may be achievable and I'm curious about what ways of talking about race will get us there. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, a lot of the students, uh, the black students at Columbia who disagreed with you actually had come from a radically a different background because you know one one critique of course of wokeism is that a number some of the people driving it uh people of color who are driving it kind of rhetorically who are out there are themselves elites and many of them didn't didn't grow up in you know dire poverty or anything and and the whole thing is working for them i mean th i'm sure this is a critique you've made i mean right i mean it's like the, 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 it's certainly when you hear the, the, the woke thing is working for them. It's getting them on MSNBC, but they're not proposing, they're not pushing policies that actually are helping uh, the black people who are in greater need, right? I mean, that that's a critique you hear. And I, I'm wondering, well, you can comment on that if you want, but I'm wondering uh, where you place, uh, I don't know if you had actual antagonists at Columbia, but 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 the people who differed with you on this and were black, kind of where you placed them socioeconomically, or am I asking you to uh, overgeneralize uh, unconscionably? <laughs> and, and, and even you know, the look, question. there's a there's a kind of person that would that thinks and says, well, Coleman, the only reason you think this stuff is because you came from uh, the upper crust, right? And if you had grown up in in the hood or with any level of um, socioeconomic disadvantage you you wouldn't you would agree with the woke mm -hmm. right? and then there's another type of person on, on the total other side of the issue that thinks um you know 
Yeah, uh, all of the woke that might go too far in the other direction. In other words, everyone in the hood really agrees with me. No, I, to be honest, what I've noticed is that there's not much of a pattern to notice. Um, I have, you know, the, the kids at Columbia dis who disagreed with me, for instance, were as likely to come from a background similar to me as they mm -hmm. were to not. Um, about, in my memory, you know, like a, a, a third to a half of, of them were actually recent African immigrants um, who weren't, d didn't have a connection to the history of slavery necessarily. Or, and and um, they were embracing the woke narrative? Oh, yes, very much so. Yeah, mm -hmm. like the, the, the writers in the student newspaper were very likely to have African first and last names, Nigerian often. Hmm. Um, and yeah, we're, we're very deep into the, the woke narrative. And so I, I noticed no pattern, you know, and, and likewise with the kids who agreed with me, right? The kids who would privately come up to me and say, hey, I agree with you. I really saw no pattern as to whether they were more likely to be, have been born into struggle or born with a silver spoon in their mouths. I, I really just noticed no such pattern. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, I, I certainly don't want to spend the whole conversation on this set of issues, but I might as well quickly characterize your views. So you're, for example, against affirmative action, right? Uh, based on race, yeah. So you, 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 so you could see economically based affirmative action so that yeah. kids below a certain income level get a preference in college sure. admissions. What, what, are the, what are other kind of substantive issues that, you'd, uh, that would round this out? in terms of characterizing your, your anti-wokeism? Uh, so, I mean, if this issue is a little stale now, but defund the police is certainly something I'm against. Um, the Black Lives Matter matters wider diagnosis of police racism and American society as fundamentally racist is something uh, I'm against. Um, I guess there are other issues. I'm sure, there are many other issues here too. On the police thing, uh, mm. did you ever have the experience growing up that you were under greater scrutiny by virtue of being black? I mean, either from police or just like walking into a to a store that has a security guard. You know. So I've never walked into a store and felt that I was being followed. Um, I mean, there's. I've had. I mean, I've had exper I've had one experience that could be interpreted that way. Um, I didn't necessarily interpret it that way. So I think when I was 15, my dad and I were driving and he got off the freeway, kind of got caught in a speed trap coming off the highway. Cop was waiting right there, maybe up in like New Hampshire or something, maybe Vermont. And uh, cop pulls us over, um, you're speeding, yada, yada. and my hands are on my lap in the passenger seat and there's kind of like a, a piece of paper over my hand or a notebook or something right so mm -hmm. you so you actually can't see my hands over under this piece of paper mm -hmm. and the cat the cop like pauses and like asks to see my hand or he asks what i'm holding in my hand right me in the passenger seat as a 15 year old kid mm -hmm. and i'm holding my iphone right so i show him show him my hand uh, holding my iphone and he had kind of asked in sort of a tense way, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, he goes back, uh, runs my dad's license or whatever, comes back, and then he comes back with a very different tone of voice, almost apo apologizing for having asked me to show my hands. Mm -hmm. But that's actually, that's what I sensed at least. And then he didn't even give my dad a ticket. I sensed as a, as a bending over backwards to, to, make sure that i didn't think his huh. asking me to show my hands was a kind of racial thing mm -hmm. so again i don't know i actually don't i can't re read the cop's mind that that could have just been totally standard protocol if mm -hmm. i were a cop i might maybe i you just always need to see everyone's hands in the car not just the guy driving it um but some people would have interpreted that it, it interpreted that as you know he wouldn't have asked me to do that if i was white and quite frankly i don't know but um, it was not a huge imposition. It was certainly a reasonable ask. 
Um, outside of that, I've never had a bad experience with with the cops. I've had uh, maybe one experience in my life where I 100% was treated differently because I was black in a racist way. Um, but very few, I'm, you know, we're talking like counting on one hand in a life of of 26 years. And was that one experience with a cop? It was not with a cop. Mm-hmm. It was uh, it was with an administration member at, uh, on Columbia's campus who uh, didn't think that I was a student and tried to was extremely suspicious of my presence in a, in an office building that I that I uh, had every right and reason to be in. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and did your parents uh, talk about this stuff? Like, did they, did they have a view on how one navigates American society while black and, and, and lay down like principles that you either have accepted or rejected? Um, it's a good question. I mean, my, they, they were certainly both very much aware of racism and also of just the the potential challenge of integrating into you know white white dominated subcultures that you might want to be into right it's like maybe not quite overt racism but you know my dad's worked in corporate america his whole life so it's like how well as a black guy do you fit into the culture of guys that are playing golf and all come from similar kinds of families and may share cultural references that you don't share and does that lack of inclusion um hamper your upward mobility in that sector right like that kind of that kind of thing Mm -hmm. um was definitely talked about uh and beyond that my my grandparents Uh, my grandparents are much much even more race conscious they grew up during jim crow so like my i joke my grandmother every time i have a bad experience she'll say was the person white right like that's the first thing that her mind goes to whereas it's Mm -hmm. it's never that wouldn't necessarily be the first thing that either of my parents minds went to or or my mind went to Mm -hmm. um but you know my i think my grandfather is probably my my biggest fan in the family in terms of agreeing with my views. Hmm. And you said uh, your grand. Well, go ahead. Were you going to say something? No, no. Go ahead. Oh, you said your grandparents uh, were more optimistic about the future um, than uh, than a lot of younger black people seem to be today. Even though uh, they grew up uh, during Jim Crow. Some of those younger people might reply, uh, well, yeah, but maybe if you had asked them, if you had said to them in in, ni- in the 1950s, hey, the civil rights uh, bill is going to pass and, and and described all the, you know, the things, you know, Jim Crow is going to end and so on. And eventually even subtle housing discrimination will be, uh, you know, against the law and so on. Um, the, the, you know, I, I'm I'm. These these young black people who disagree with you might say your grandparents probably would have imagined that by now things would be better for the average black person in America. And so their challenge, you might be, well, what are we supposed to do? We, we, you know, we're we think wokeism will do it. You, you obviously disagree. But uh, what do you say to that? You know, I, I hesitate to speak on behalf of anyone else, but knowing I mean, knowing what my grandfather says about current society, the truth is, is is the the precise opposite. If you had asked, I mean, just, just look, just think about this. If you asked any black person in 2006 whether we could elect a black president, most would have said no, right? They, which is to say, they had too pes- pessimistic a view just within a two or three year window of the country. If you would ask black people in the 1950s in the 1960s, how far they thought we would have gotten by now, um, none would have said we could have had a black president, for example. Um, none would have even said we could have had a black vice president. Uh, and, you know, a couple weeks ago, or a couple months ago, actually, my grandfather came up to visit me in New York. 
and saw me perform at a music club where, where I play. And I had a friend there who was a white woman. And he just, he commented that he, he saw me just very in a relaxed manner having this friendship with a white woman, right? And he commented to me of how shocking it was because j just to think of the difference of him in the 1950s and 60s crossing the color line as they would have called it then to have a friendship much you know to say nothing of a flirtation mm -hmm. with a white woman compared to now that, that the fact that i wouldn't even think about it um that was amazing to him so grafting that attitude i have to think his attitude would be the opposite it would be we've come much further than i even could have imagined mm -hmm. Okay, I'd like to, um, I want to talk about the music a little, the hip hop. First, I want to ask one more question along these lines, which is like, uh, you know, it, probably after this uh, airs, somebody who disagrees with you will say, you should have asked him this. Uh, and I don't yet know what that will be. But do you have an idea of like, if Ibram X. Kendi were sitting next to me, uh, or Nicole Hannah Jones or somebody, w mm -hmm. and I, I take it you would say yes. You disagree with both of them about a lot of stuff. Like, what would they say? Well, do you do you have an idea of like they'd say, ask Coleman this. This will this will give him trouble. They so they would say, look, you're you're pointing to Barack Obama, Kamala Harris, uh, your your ability to have a white friend as an indicator of progress. What about the 10 to 1 black white wealth gap? What about George Floyd? What about, um, you know, all of the evidence of systemic bias in every system from healthcare, where we have maternal mortality disparities to criminal justice system um, and and all the rest? I mean, this is, they would say, evidence that the the nation is profoundly racist that some would even go so far as to say the subtler kinds of racism that we have now are just as bad or maybe in some ways worse than the overt racism that we had in the past and so the things you're adducing as evidence of progress are superficial compared to the mountain of evidence that racism pervades society that's probably something like what they would say and what would your answer be so the problem is you know the accusation it's sort of like what well, what is that law that it takes more work to refute bullshit than it does to create it <laughs> not to say that all of this all of these things are bullshit but the you know most of the evidence of systemic racism boils down to the mere pointing to disparities as as um, prima facie evidence for racism and that that's just a fallacy um there are in each of these cases there are i mean there's there are usually always facts that undermine this narrative so for example there the, the more maternal mortality problem where you have black women of every socioeconomic background more likely to die uh, in childbirth uh, com when compared to white women. This, obviously, every woman that dies in childbirth is a, is a, is a absolute tragedy. It's like it's, it's heart wrenching to even think of a single example, much less multiply them and think about all of the victims of this in the aggregate and in, in the aggregate. Uh, but when you do that, you, you also see that you know, Hispanic women, for some reason, fare better than even white women. And uh, the, the explanations for these things are multivariate. They, they could have to do with everything from just fluke. Uh, you know, it, 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 there's literally a hundred different potential causes of this. And race, racial discrimination on the part of doctors whether it's that they're not seeing that their black patients are in pain, something like that. Um, I mean, that's one of a hundred variables it could be. And when you look at the broader landscape of disparities, uh, 
it, it becomes less and less plausible that racism is the driving force behind really any of these. It's like, okay, you look at one disease that black people are dying more of than white people, right? And you say, oh, well, that's got to be racism, that's systemic racism right there. But then I can give you 10 diseases where white people are dying from them more than black people, right? And I've, I've looked at uh, the CDC numbers and all this stuff, and and then people have no explanation. It's like, the truth, and this is this is Sowell's, the point of half of Sowell's books, at least, is that Thomas dis yeah, disparity is the norm on every metric you could possibly measure between every group and between different ethnicities of one particular race. Huge disparities quite often. And discrimination is one potential cause of, of those, and sometimes, no doubt, is the cause. But um, I find it very, I mean, I, I tend to think that, you know, 90 plus percent of the cause of most disparities has to do with factors that are not racism. Of course, it depends on each, each conversation should be had on its own. Mm -hmm. But, um, but that's my basic criticism. And on the, the wealth gap, uh, which is significant and even the income gap, uh, would you would you say i mean you you don't purport to have a miracle cure i guess but you might say that actually some of the policies uh they favor in some subtle sense even get in the way of progress is that the idea some of them would i mean certainly defund the police is horrible for high crime neighborhoods um it is uh, it if you're going to ask why this place is a food desert or why all the stores here need bulletproof glass you know, getting rid of the police is not going to solve that problem. Getting rid of the police is not going to lead to businesses and investment flooding into this neighborhood, creating local jobs and so forth. Um, so that, that's an example, certainly, of a counterproductive policy. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, in, in general, there is a, well, I guess, I guess I'll just leave it there. Okay. The um, So on to music. Uh, now, I should preface this by saying that everything I know about hip hop, I learned within the last week by watching the first two episodes of this, <laughs> this PBS series on, have you watched this? There's a four part the PBS hip -hop, series. Hip hop evolution. Yeah, I guess that's what it's called. The, the, uh, two, two episodes have aired. There are going to be two more. Oh no, no. You were just thinking of something different. I'm thinking of the Netflix documentary hip hop evolution. Oh no, this is a thing airing right now on PBS. Um, okay. it's interesting. I mean, I, I'd actually, uh, I'd be interested in hearing your, your view of it uh mm -hmm. they're emphasizing very much the political uh aspect uh, and uh i suspect that some people might argue that they're reading a little bit of the current moment into its origins i mean mm -hmm. there is uh, uh viewing it maybe as more organically a part of uh you know everything from the civil rights movement on uh, than maybe was the case. Although, you know, there is, there definitely are politically conscious hip hop songs. And one of them that sounded vaguely familiar when I heard it, and I really like upon closer examination is, I guess, super famous, The Message by Grandmaster Flash. Mm -hmm. You know that song? I do, yeah. I'm curious what you think of it for, so, before we get to your music. So it's like, uh, it's basically, it comes out in 1982, and it's like mm -hmm. a litany of the horrors of living in in a in a uh, you know low income inner city black neighborhood, mm -hmm. and it's um I, I like it musically, and it kind of does cover the waterfront, right? I mean, it describes you know uh, the frustrations, and and it describes the predicament of a young kid who like grows up and says and looks around and says, well. The way you get respect around here is to have money. The way you get money mm -hmm. around here is to break the law. And mm -hmm. then the kid winds up in prison and they have the kid winding up hanging himself after being sexually abused in the song. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it, it's, uh, you know, I think I think it's a pretty solid song. I mean, I really, I really no, it's like a great it. song. Yeah, yeah, so you like it. It's a that. classic and it's, yeah, it's tragic. You know, it's a, it's, it's describing a tragic situation where even a very reasonable and well-meaning person can end up, you know, on the wrong side of, side of the law and, you know, paying the consequences. Mm -hmm. 
the um so your uh your album is called what it's uh Amor, Amor Fati. Fati. Well, now yeah. I assume Amor refers to love. Maybe I'm wrong, yeah. but but I certainly don't know what Fati refers to. Refers to fate. Okay, it's a la Latin phrase that means love of fate, loving uh -huh. one's fate. Um, and does that mean you love your fate? <laughs> means I try to. I like the idea that you you act as if everything that's happened in your life was fated to happen and that therefore you should not dwell on the way things could have turned out. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's a song on there called 25. I think it's called mm -hmm. 25, which mm -hmm. uh, is on YouTube. And, and your, your, your hip hop name is Cold X Man, one word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I assume in honor of Ibram X. Kendi or no? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, the, um, and, but there's a line, 25 years I've been running from my fate. Mm -hmm. Is that about you? Maybe so. Yeah. I mean, I think I have as much tendency as anyone to, wor you know, wonder what my life, you know, might've turned out differently. I've had a very strange path in life. I've become this person that's, a, a contrarian on race issues. I'm a, I'm a black guy that thinks the wrong things about race. And that's caused quite a bit of friction in my life. And it's been, uh, it's, there's points at which it's been rough at which I've wondered, maybe I just should have done something more conventional with my life. Maybe I just, I'm a smart enough guy. I could have made money doing any number of things and had, had a quiet, nice life. And yet I, just couldn't keep my mouth shut about uh, about controversial issues, and uh, and so my life took a turn. Uh, and in a way, it, it's interesting. I don't know if you agree with this, but with many careers, it seems like you could you could just do the career for five years, and then if you don't, if you choose to switch those five years don't follow you around forever, right? The mm -hmm. legacy of those five years uh, is forgotten and you just reinvent yourself, right? But if you're a writer leaving a paper trail or a commentator leaving a speaking trail of, of all of your thoughts and you weigh in on any controversial issue, which are generally the interesting ones, then uh, you know you, the legacy of that work follows you, right? And it's, I, I heard what you, you know, what Bob said about the war in Iraq really pissed me off in 2003, and now it's 2023, and I'm going to yell at him about it, right? Actually, I'm totally good on that score. I was against the war. I'm, right, I'm right. hoping <laughs> bring that up. That's true. But, That's uh, true. You're right. That's true. I, I have my skeletons, and I will not be mentioning them in, in this conversation. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, I think that's what I'm getting at with that line is it's a, it's it's an unforgiving career in that way. Yeah. And actually more so than it used to be. And I, I'm old enough to remember life before the Internet. And, you know, back when you had to to find an old New York Times piece, you had to physically go to a library. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was a lot easier to write stuff that people uh, would forget. Um, mm -hmm. And and I think this is somewhat true, truer for even people who aren't writers now that that parts of their past, you know, with social media and everything can follow them around. But, but you're absolutely right that uh, in this line of work, uh, you don't just, uh, you don't just, uh, you know, close one door and move on as readily as you might. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, how, how painful is it for you? I mean, uh, are you somebody who is, who does, who really would like to be liked by everybody? And so this is really profoundly uncomfortable? It's interesting. I don't know how to place myself on that spectrum because I've never been anyone else. I, 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 so I can only place myself relative to my perceptions of how desperate other people are to be liked. Um, so, but without, I guess, trying to place myself anywhere on that spectrum, which, which seems impossible really to do, I can say, yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty, I, I like to be liked by people. I don't, I'm not a, um, 
I'm not someone I think that gets energy and uh, who enjoys being uh, the object of derision or controversy um, or even really the center of any kind of controversial attention. I, I generally don't really like that. Um, and I'm also not the most combative or or uh, let's say, what would the word be? Um, disagreeable, at, at least not compared to some, you know, people in this line of work that I know. So, you know, like when I'm, I've been in situations where I'm just like being a person at a dinner and someone has discovered, oh, this guy was against reparations. And now it's like a, a very tense and unpleasant argument. And that kind of thing really does bother me because I I don't I never like to be the source of ruining a night over politics that didn't need, need to be discussed. Mm -hmm. And yet, because I have had a high profile at certain times, that's just been that's been dictated for me. Right. Others have said, we're going to make your presence here. Your presence here is a provocation, essentially. Mm -hmm. So there, those things have been have been difficult for me. But what are you going to do? You know, if you can't take the heat, you get out the kitchen. So it's it's overall, um, I'm quite happy, and I've had, I don't think I've lost any close friendships over my work, but there has been a, a definitely an amount of discord in my life, like a, a raised. I've raised the level of discord in my life by by pursuing this line of work. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, do you plan to, whether because of this or not, uh, because of whatever discomfort there is or not, do you plan to broaden the things you write about? I mean, as I said, you know, your, 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 your podcast, uh, shows you to be interested in a whole lot of subjects. You, you majored mm -hmm. in philosophy. Is that part of the plan? No, totally. Uh, so you know i don't it's interesting and kind of paradoxical because i'm not that interested in the topic of race like i said growing up race was not something that i was very interested in whether that be the meaning of one's racial identity or e even the history of race my attitude has always been racism is stupid i feel bad for actual racists um and uh because they're just you know they, they have a pathetic and uh limiting worldview and that the rest of us should basically get on with it um and do whatever interesting things that you as an individual want to do and that are within your capabilities and associate with whom whoever you want to associate with fall in love with whoever you want to fall in love with marry whoever you want to marry and it's it's nobody's business um and and the thing I, the things i was always interested in were really philosophy and science topics um so yeah i do more and more want to write about those things and i am and uh so so my weighing into the topic of race is something that I I don't enjoy as much as you would think by how much I do it. But I know that people find it to be really valuable. And um, I do have thoughts. And sometimes I do get, <laughs> to use a word, triggered by the, the level of the discourse um, that I see in major newspapers and uh and, and so I feel I have something of value to say on it but I'm not I don't get as much actual pleasure out of culture war adjacent topics as I do out of timeless uh philosophical and scientific topics mm -hmm. um you, you said you you feel sorry for racists do you like go through the exercise or have you ever gone through the exercise of kind of looking at where they come from, how they grew up, what their experiences were and so on, and kind of say, 
well, I understand how they became racist. Yeah. Like there, but to the grace of God. Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, uh, sometimes I think of, uh, you know, and I think it was 2020. It was, in fact, it was during 2020, probably during the summer of 2020. I was in the financial district in Manhattan and I, uh, walking on just an obscure corner somewhere near Pearl Street or Wall Street or something. And there was this little uh, kind of South Asian, probably Indian um, cart. He had a cart. He was selling newspapers and peanuts and so forth. And there's nobody around on this particular corner. And this uh, really tall black kid comes up and just robs him in broad daylight. Brute force. Um, it probably takes had. Month, says, give me your money. And he. Yep. Forces open the cash register, takes all the cash. Did he have a and... weapon? No, he didn't have a weapon. Just but he, physically he, intimidating. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't need one. He was probably over a foot, over a foot taller than this guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I saw. I was stunned. I saw it. He took. He took all the money. He kind of made eye contact with me very briefly, because I was the only witness. And then just ran away. Mm-hmm. And what struck me was like, well, two things. One was how hard this cart keeper was struggling to keep it he really put up a fight but he was absolutely no match but he Mm -hmm. put up a fight with the will of someone who knew that this was everything he had Mm -hmm. like he he was going to get beat up if if necessary to protect his livelihood he wasn't just going to roll over even though he had he had no chance against this kid and i thought of the experiences i've seen um and and some of the things some of the racist things i've heard such people say about black people right like the racist things i've heard south asian immigrants say about black people and um if if i were to as an exercise try to get into this guy's head Mm -hmm. you move to a city and try to you're an upstart from nothing um you come to a whole new country to, to start a new life. You have a little business that is extremely competitive and you work probably, you probably sleep at most six hours a night, if that, because you're working so much physically, demanding work. And you're in a town where you don't know any of the historical context of the country necessarily. That's not really your concern. You just come to a place and try to do something and your number one concern is like you know the 70 percent of violent crime in the city is by one particular racial group what what attitudes are you going to form about that group and do you have to be an evil person in order to begin to really believe some nasty stereotypes when you're put in a position of fear like that um so i can i mean you, that that's the type of thing where such a person could actually become a racist, not having started one. And I'm not sure they would have to be a monster to start forming some pretty monstrous views. Mm-hmm. And what about the, the kid who robbed him? Can you uh, think about his background? I mean, conjecturally, in a way that leads you to the conclusion that you know, that could be me or you or you in some sense understand how he wound up like that? Of course. I mean, so if I try to do that, I would even I would even set, put it more close to home. I think about my uncle who uh, has been in and out of jail his whole life and is you know, cur- currently in jail, um, in prison, rather. And what it's like to grow up especially as a man in an environment where the the closest thing to reach for in order to feel status and masculinity is a life of crime and you know growing up 
looking up to people who who really seem like men that are attractive and self-possessed and what they're doing is they're they're basically in like a little local army right it's like all of the psychology of of military um of being in the military essentially but in your local hood right and you choose a gang and you're with them and you end up basically fighting a battle against other rival gangs and doing unspeakable you know murder robbery etc but all within that tribal psychology of deep loyalty to your particular band of men that are doing this um and it just seems normal to you because it's what you grew up grew, grew up with mm-hmm. and the only reason it it that's why it seemed normal to my uncle who who grew up in the hood and that's why it seems absolutely abnormal to me because i didn't grow up there that's not really a comment on either of our virtues as individuals it's a comment on what was considered normal behavior between the ages of zero to 18 in our neighborhoods in our social contexts mm-hmm. um so i i can put myself in those shoes too but still it the the experience of of seeing the victimization of one kind of person by the other kind of person was very visceral for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's go back to the song 25. There's, uh, there's also a line that says, what is it, 25 years never looking at the clock? Mm-hmm. Is that about you? And if so, what does it mean? I don't really know what that one means. I think it just sounds good. <laughs> okay. Like, you know, I, I, I find this to be true of most people who write lyrics, and I, I find it frustrating. I always want there to be an answer. Sometimes it's just intuition. It's not really. You just write something because it feels right rather than because it means something legible to you. Yeah. So what about in 25 years, I'll still be on the top. That would seem to be an assertion of self-confidence. Yeah, it would be. It would be. And I think a lot of times a song, it serves as a venue for me to be more confident than I actually feel. Yeah, and it's a and little it's like bit a, of the, a, an aspirational truth. And is it somewhat characteristic of hip hop? All right, I yeah, mean self assertion. Totally. totally. Um, the uh, and speaking of hip hop, so Thomas Chatterton Williams wrote a book called uh, "What Is It Losing My Cool" or something. Losing anyway, my cool. The, the, the subtitles: How a Father's Love and Fifteen Thousand Books Beat Hip Hop Culture. Uh, do you, do you do you see hip hop culture as I mean I take it he's seeing hip hop culture broadly or at least some per- particular influential part of it as being a bad thing. Mm-hmm. What what's your take on if there, if there is even a, a thing that you can call uh, coherent enough to call hip hop culture? But and if so, whether it's good or bad. Yeah. So Thomas ended up getting really involved in some bad behavior, some criminal adjacent behavior. Um as a result of him and his friends trying to be like their favorite rappers. Uh, and that, that happens. Now the question is, you know, would that happen absent hip hop culture too? I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know the counterfactual, but, um, you know, to the extent that you seriously idolize people that are bragging about committing crime all day, uh, that's going to lead you down. That can't possibly do good things for you. Right. One of Thomas's point in, the, in Thomas's points in that book is that many kids are able to listen to hip hop with a level of ironic distance, or just mm-hmm. enough of a, of a kind of distance from the literal lyrics, such that they would they could listen to the hardest core rapper all day, but never be tempted to actually follow in their literal footsteps. Right? They they understand the message on a more abstract level to be about toughness, but not necessarily like, oh yeah, I'm going to rob a bank because Lil Wayne raps about robbing a bank or something, Mm -hmm. right? I'm going to go commit a murder. No, it's, I'm going to be tough like him. I'm tapping into some inner toughness that I relate to some inner masculinity, whatever it is. Um, but, but Thomas definitely earlier, I, I think in his life, had a more literal relationship to the hip-hop lifestyle um 
so I guess what what, what exactly was well, I'm wondering, was your question? Uh, you, you know, it, it sounds like you are sharing his assumption that there's a lot of potentially negative influence emanating from hip hop. If you if you uh, if you kind of uh, take it, uh, take it too seriously, um, maybe another question is whether that's changed. I, I mean, as I said, you know, the, the, this this kind of uh, seminal song, the message seems to me like, uh, you know, pretty unobjectionable. I, I don't think they're glamorizing any bad behavior in that. And they're actually, there's a warning against the light yeah. of crime if you, if, if you listen to it. And, yeah. and they are dramatizing how bad the situation is in the inner city. And mm -hmm. I take the, 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 uh, the title of the message to be like, pay attention. And, and I also take, I'm curious as you're taking, there's this line, uh, this kind of famous line, uh, don't push me. I'm close to the edge. Uh, trying not to I'm lose trying my head. Not to lose my head. I, I took that to be both like, okay, this is a guy like, don't fuck with me. But it's also, I took it to be a collective warning in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. Like, this is how bad things are for us. Um, pay attention. You know, yeah. you don't want to push a whole people over the edge. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I never understood it that way. Um, I mean, overall, no, I don't think hip hop is harmful. I think it's, it, I mean, there's so many different kinds of hip hop. It's, it's there, there is, there is pure brag about crime hip hop with no, basically no complexity to it. Which is what people mean by gangster rap. Is that more or less what you take that to mean? Yeah, I think that's probably what people mean by, by gangster rap. Um, Although even like even NWA had more to it than purely bragging about successfully committing lots of crime and treating women poorly. There are rappers that are like a hundred percent of their MO is I commit crimes, I'm really good at it, and I'm horrible to women. There are some rappers like that, and um I find that very unrelatable and uninteresting. And to the extent that you idolize that, it could definitely lead you to it could reinforce i mean if you like that there must be some part of you that's like gravitating to that already but look so much of hip-hop is not that so much mm -hmm. of hip-hop is um people conveying their like real inner struggles about how to behave better in life uh it's you can never say kendrick lamar is you know a, a lot of when kendrick lamar raps about crime a lot of times it's with it's with the understanding that he's he's telling you not to do this stuff right or he's he's exposing the dysfunction of a certain lifestyle mm -hmm. if you listen to kendrick lamar's lyrics without understanding the irony you don't understand them right um so that's just one particular case where what can seem to be criminal aspirations are properly understood warnings against the um depravity of certain lifestyles um yeah so i, I would never paint hip-hop with a broad brush and i'm not saying thomas necessarily did in that book i mean that book is really a memoir mm -hmm. um and i thomas actually loves hip-hop uh but yeah i mean so there are different kinds of hip-hop that you know appreciating diff those different kinds of hip-hop would lead to different results as a person mm -hmm. Um, the, uh, so you're uh, a song you did like a year ago is called blasphemy. And, um, that, that's about you being uh, a black person who's saying things that are very much not in favor among uh, a lot of the black people. Uh, I guess at that point, almost in your, in your college milieu or, uh, or, or your immediate kind of post-college milieu. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I, I assume that's that's a solid interpretation. Of that song. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. It's it's a, it's uh, the production values are extremely high. I mm -hmm. mean, both musically and visually. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that how did that happen? It was like uh, I mean, a number of people involved. It's like the closing credits are like, you know, yeah, of like Ben Hur or something. It's like, you know, yeah, my friend Ian Pond's Jewel. So I, I made that song myself and i sent it to ian who i had just met through twitter 
And he had kind of offhandedly said, hey, if you ever need some film stuff, I, I may be down to work with you. So uh, I sent it to him. He loved it. And he just basically took it on as a project. And he's a major commercial director. So mm -hmm. he was just able to make most of that stuff happen. At a, we kind of took it on as a passion project. So it's really up on him. So there's a, a pretty jarring scene where you very vividly get shot in the head mm -hmm. by, I take it, it's supposed to be one of these people who disagrees with you so violently that they're not going to take it lying down. Uh, did you agonize over whether to put that in? No. I mean, you know, it was, like I said, Ian directed the video, so I gave him the basic parameters of what I wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. And then he did all the he wrote all the specific things that happen in the video. Um, so by the time it, that was planned out, I you know I couldn't I couldn't be like oh I'm what are my what are my sisters going to think when they see this you know yeah um, but no I, I didn't I didn't mind it I thought it was cool I think that's a lot of people thought that was the coolest part of the video. So you write the music and the lyrics. Of your song yes yeah and then you uh, you you do the orchestration or whatever you like yep and and I, so you you and do you do some of the actual music uh what do you mean the actual music well to the extent that there's musical accompaniment are you playing some of those instruments so i i produce all the beats myself uh -huh. um i don't know if you know much about like sampling and how hip-hop producers work but it's like no usually... i know how they used to work but i gather they're not still using vinyl no but the principle is the same you know you chop a little bit of a song uh -huh. manipulate it and add drums and create a whole beat so i do all of that myself and then i record the lyrics huh. well it's impressive I thank mean, you again this is coming from somebody who <laughs> knew nothing about hip-hop 10 days ago uh, but now considers himself an authority, but still, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a sincere compliment. Yeah, um, thank you. The uh, So I don't know, uh, what else, uh, anything else you want to be asked about? I mean, uh, I don't, you know, I've been a fan of yours for a long time. I really oh. loved your, your book, uh, Why Buddhism is True. Uh, God bless I thought you. it was, I thought it was... Uh, the perfect kind of intervention on that conversation of uh and the and the you know exactly the book that i wanted someone to write about mm. that topic well thank you uh, uh we need more americans like you um <laughs> the uh one final question that's uh, in a very different vein uh i know when you were on Joe Rogan's show, you you uttered one sentence about immigration that got a lot of blowback, and you addressed mm -hmm. it in a subsequent podcast. It was basically did, just yeah. saying uh, a lot of conservatives oppose immigration, and 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 you meant to you 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 know you you kind of meant to say illegal immigration, but you forgot to throw the qualifier in there. That was no big yes. deal. More recently, you did uh, a thing on Israel mm -hmm. uh, with the Israeli historian Benny Morris. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's pretty hard to, to say something about that without getting blowback. I'm wondering if, you, if you've gotten some. So, so I've read some of the feedback I've gotten so far and, uh, you know, I'm by no means an Israel expert, but I know enough to ask the right questions to someone who is. And, and Benny Morris is certainly an expert on, on the history. And I think most people on both sides of the issue don't really dispute his credentials as a historian mm -hmm. um but some dispute his attitudes on the conflict currently so he's mm -hmm. he's very much so he's in this weird position of being one of the people most responsible for unearthing israel's war war crimes essentially against palestinians what would now be called war crimes um whether that concept was was really in people's minds in, in the 1940s um, but he's, you know, as responsible as anyone for unearthing Israel's intentional, the intentional aspects of Israel's expulsion of Palestinians uh, during and after the independence war and, um, and, and many other similar, similar things.
but he's also been a big defender of Israel in the past, let's say, 20 years, 25 years of Israel's uh, self-defense policies and and so forth. Uh, and yet he also refused to serve in the West Bank um, as an Israeli himself and said that he would probably still refuse today on moral grounds. He's he's on both sides of the issue in, in a particular kind of way, but his recent uh his recent musings about the issue certainly seem to be more on the pro-israel side mm -hmm. um so i've gotten i don't think i've gotten any pushback on the history that was dealt with but i've gotten pushback on having a guess that is one-sidedly pro-israel in terms of the current politics of the issue mm -hmm. are you thinking about having a palestinian on yeah, I mean, having the I would love to have the right person on to to uh, get into the weeds on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I mean, I thought for what it's worth, I, I I did a good job. I try, I really tried to do my best job, like you do on this podcast, pressing him on the the best arguments on the other side of the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as you say, he's a. Uh, his his work on history has been very important. Um, but I could kind of imagine as I was listening to him describe the current situation, the uh, the points that somebody on the other side would have made. Um, so, um, well, congratulations on everything. Uh, how old are you? Are you, so the song 25, was that written when you were 25, which is about it now was, or what? How old are you? So it was written when I was 25, but it didn't come out until much later. So at this point, I'm turning 27 in about oh, two man. weeks. Oh, that's so sad. That's so <laughs> yeah. sad. <laughs> I know. Uh, okay. it's, it's, yeah, it's downhill from here. What um, do? So uh, anyway, the, the album, do they still call them albums? <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> uh -huh. But no, they call them albums, but no one really cares about them anymore. It's all about singles these days. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I saw you've gotten a lot of pickup on YouTube for the one that came out earlier, the uh, mm -hmm. the blasphemy one. Um, yeah. And now you've got some of these are on YouTube and some aren't. Twenty five is on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so anyway, the uh, and the and the name of your podcast is Conversations with Coleman. The Substack is Coleman's Corner, right? And what's your mm -hmm. uh, what's your Twitter handle? At Cold X Man. Okay, which is your hip hop name? Mm hmm. All right. Well, thanks so much for taking the time and uh, continued good luck. Thanks for having me on.